Good evening, everyone. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father, Jesus Christ, our resurrected, risen, reigning, returning redeemer. I thank the Lord for another Tuesday that God has granted us the opportunity to gather together to be about studying God's word and preparation and ministering to the people that God brings into our lives. Welcome each and every one of you to our last Bible study for this year. Uh, we will be on break uh, for the next two weeks. As you know, next Tuesday is Christmas. Um, and we will not be having Bible study then, and then the following week is actually January 1st. And so we will reconvene on January 8th, if you'll help spread the word. And by then, we will be in the midst of our fast. And so tonight, I wanted to take this last opportunity in Bible study to uh, talk a little bit about fasting. Um, I'm going to get into it in just a moment. Let me begin by welcoming those who may be with us for the first time. Uh, if you chose the last Bible study of the year to make your first Bible study, we're grateful for you. If this is your first Tuesday with us, would you just wave a hand? We want to recognize anyone for the first time. Welcome, 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 welcome. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Please, please do not be ashamed or embarrassed to ask questions, to pause. I do want to let you know just so we have protocol. Two things. One, if you do have a question, please go to the microphone. We have a lot of... Um, members and family who connect online and when we're not in the microphones they cannot hear us and it puts them at a disadvantage and we recognize that Alpha Street is so much bigger than this building um, and we thank God for those who watch online so we want to honor their presence by using the microphones and number two know that everything uh, that I shared tonight is going to be online and so you don't have to jot everything down I see people sometimes with their cell phones trying to take pictures of the screen you ain't got to do none of that just go online download the whole Bible study afterwards and you are going to be blessed I want you to share in the reading of the Word of God with me to lay the foundation for um, what we're going to get into on tonight turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew Matthew chapter 17 Matthew chapter 17, before we begin. Everybody in Matthew, um, we're going to drop down to verse 14. In chapter 17, beginning in verse 14. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. For he is an epileptic and suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. For surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, and you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Um, a familiar passage of a father who comes who has a son who suffers with epilepsy and of course in that day and time they believed that that was attached to demonic possession and so the father brings the son to the disciples believing that the disciples ought to be able to do what Christ is able to do there's the anticipation that if you follow the Lord then some of what the Lord does, you ought to be able to exhibit in your own life, right? That the followers of Jesus ought to be witnesses of the power of Jesus. And the disciples fail to be able to cast the demon out. And Jesus gives an answer. What is Jesus' first answer? Why they, don't, why they can't cast him out? They don't have beliefs, so there's some faith issue here, right? And that's where you get the whole mustard seed. If you have faith the size of mustard seed and you say to the mountain, be you moved, the mountain will be moved. So Jesus tells the disciples, number one, you've got to have faith. And then he says, but there's another level because some things don't simply move by faith. That faith in and of itself is not enough to move you and to grow you 
and to allow you to be my witnesses. So he says to them, what else? Some things come out by, only by what? Prayer and fasting. Look at the three things Jesus commends for us who would be his followers to operate with his power in this world. Faith, prayer, and fasting. And I would argue to you that many of us can probably identify these two as strong in our life, at least growing in our faith, growing in our prayer life. But the Lord himself suggests that there's some things that require faith, prayer, and fasting. Just quickly, by wave of hand, how many people tonight can say that you've ever gone on an intentional, disciplined fast? An intentional, disciplined fast. Praise the Lord. How many of you join with us in January, this will be your first time fasting? It's all right. Be your first time. Praise the Lord. It won't be your last. It won't be your last. I want to talk to you about Seek 2019, which is um, a vision uh, God gave to me and then with the ministerial staff we were able to shape and inform it a little bit better about a call to prayer and fasting. There have been seasons in my life when I have felt God calling me to more, more than just faith and more than just a prayer life. And I hope that you sense in moments of your walk with the Lord that there's this urge inside of you to do more. That have you ever sensed God calling you? You just didn't know what it was, but you knew you're supposed to be doing more. Uh, that you're supposed to be more dedicated, that there was another level God wanted you to be at, that God was calling you to a season of intimacy, but you just didn't know how to do it. Uh, but sensing that, um, I laugh with a lot of people who come to me and say that they've been called to preach because most people confuse a call to ministry with God simply calling you to a season of being closer, right? That simply because the Lord is calling you into a place of solitude and intimacy with him does not mean you're being called to preach, does not mean you're being called to lead in ministry. You've got to be clear on those too. But the Lord has called me to those moments and they're usually in time in two places. Either one, when I'm really struggling to hear and discern the will of God at that crossroad um, where we struggle to know what God wants from us. Um, and then secondly, when I realize the Lord's been trying to prepare me for something I didn't know was coming. Um, whether that be a great assignment or a great challenge. Um, if we look at Jesus and his fasting, his fasting precedes his struggle with the devil in the wilderness. It didn't happen during the 40 days, it happened after, and the fasting was meant to prepare him not simply for ministry, but also confrontation. And sometimes the call to fast is really in preparation for a great season of struggle you're about to go through. If, if you had a forecast tonight that it was going to pour down raining tomorrow, what would you do tonight to get ready? Get your stuff ready, get my raincoat out, get my umbrella. What would you do if you knew God was telling you in February you're about to go through hell? In February, your loved one's going to leave you. In February, you're going to get laid off. In February, the doctor's going to tell you cancer. What would you do if you knew the struggle was coming? Well, spiritually, the Lord says you got to fast. That the call to fasting is not simply to get you ready for some great work and miracle and you laying your hands on someone and they being raised from the dead, but in preparation for whatever God has in store for you. And I've sensed for about a year now that the Lord was calling us as a church family to a time of prayer and fasting. And what we did not do well last year is structure it into our calendar. So that when we felt, when I felt it and the ministers were working on it with me, we realized, and this is a sad statement for a church, we realized we could not find 30 days where we could call this church to prayer and fasting and it not interfere with some food event that we had planned. Right, right. Uh, the, the best window we found interfered with the Six Flag event. And we knew if we we're going to be serious about this fast, it's not just something you throw on your calendar. It's something that moves everything off. Because what's the point of fasting if you're not moving stuff out the way? Um, so we sat down this year and we're more deliberate because we know and believe God is calling us to do this. 
And I'll speak a little bit more about why in a moment, uh, but it was important to be able to find that time to block it out and to invite you to be on this journey with me. So I was having a conversation with um, someone the other day and we were joking around and I said to him, um, you know, we, we were joking about, um, about scripture quoting and we had a little contest and I knew more scriptures than he did. Um, and I should have too, because there's a member. If I'd lost to a member, it's going to be a problem, Earl. Uh, and he said, well, pastor, how do you know so many scriptures? And this is my joke to him. I said, well, I'm a practicing Christian, right? That I'm a practicing Christian. Now we've heard that language with other religions, but very rarely does someone self-identify as a practicing Christian. We just say we're Christian. And what's removed from that is realization that as a Christian, there are some things I should be practicing every day. If you look at other world religions, there are practices that help you identify that they are an adherent to that religious belief. So you are not a card-carrying Muslim if you don't pray five times a day and face these, right? Um, if you are not serious about Ramadan, if you do not take seriously the charge to make a pilgrimage to the holy city, right? Um, even devout Jews, those of us who went to Israel saw that there are certain things they practice regularly. The Sabbath is one, right? Um, they, right, shut everything. How, how many of y'all were there on the Sabbath? You said that it's shut down. If you're going to Israel, don't go between Friday night and Saturday night, right? Because it, it shuts down. So I thought I'd ask this question to start us off with, what are the spiritual disciplines of Christianity? Right? What, what are we supposed to practice daily? So when I say disciplines, I mean what we practice. What is it that a Christian is supposed to do that identifies you as a Christian? It's not in what you wear, right? There's no, there's no Christian garment. What are we supposed to do? Just shout out some answers. What are, we, what are we supposed to practice that makes us Christian? Prayer, right? You ought to be praying. Huh? Faith, walking in faith, okay. Forgiveness, hallelujah to the Lamb. Love, read the Bible, right? Gratefulness, watch what we eat. Now, who said that? Who said, now, 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 there would be a bone of contention because in every other world religion, there are dietary restrictions. You may practice them, but we'd be hard pressed to identify what is a Christian diet. Have you all ever seen this documentary on PBS called Church Food? Yeah, Google it. It's a thing called Church Food. Church food will kill you. Black church food will put you in your grave. Part of the reason I'm excited about this fast because I don't want no more fried chicken, green beans, mashed potatoes, and rolls. If we have any funeral during the fast, it's going to be a vegan funeral. Amen. We go <laughs> There will be no fried chicken in this building for at least three weeks. Amen. Um, so we got diet, got reading the Bible, forgiveness, walking in love, prayer. Um, let me read you a quote about our spiritual disciplines. Um, it's from Richard Foster's book, The Celebration of Discipline. And he says, the things we must train ourselves to do frequently and regularly to grow in our discipleship. Now, there's a challenge right there because in most Christian traditions, in most churches, we believe that the minute you walk down that aisle and give your life to Jesus, there's no more growing, right? How are you intentional about growing? How are you intentional about being a better Christian? It doesn't just happen because you claim Christ. So my oldest son, um, praise the Lord, made JV. He's starting. He skipped freshman ball. He's starting on JV. That's why I miss a lot of stuff because I'm always at his games. I want to support him. And he's got natural talent, but he also knows I got to work at it, right? So even though he's on a holiday break this week and there's no practice, he wants to meet with his trainer. And that's how I know he wants to be a better ball player because he's saying to me, I want to train this week, Dad. I got to get in the gym. I got to work on it. He's intentional about knowing if I don't work on this, I'm not going to get better, right? Skip my height. I got to work hard at this. What do we do? to intentionally grow as Christians. I mean, if you, if you really think about it, 
For most of us, our prayer life, no, let me phrase that. For all of us, our prayer life could be better. Right? All of us. All of us have room to grow in our prayer life. Bible reading, we got a long way to go with some of that. Got a long way to go. What do we intentionally do every day to get stronger as Christians? And what Richard Foster argues is there's some things you've got to do frequently and regularly in order to grow in your walk. And in his work, he identified three different categories of disciplines, corporate, personal, and I think the other one was inner. So let's start with the corporate ones that he lists. Some of the corporate things we're supposed to practice according to the Bible that help us grow. You may not believe this, but confessing sins to one another is one of the things the Bible says helps us grow. Now, you and I both know that's dangerous, right there, right, right? <laughs> that, that, that's dangerous, that's dangerous. But answer this question for me. How do I grow by confessing my sins to Dash? If Dash and I are in a close enough relationship and I feel comfortable sharing with him where I have sinned, how does that help me grow? Trust, Trust accountability, accountability. Well, the trust factor, yes, but Dash can now hold me accountable, right? He's now my prayer partner. He's now the one, if he's got any Christian compassion, will call me on Friday, what are you doing? <laughs> now, we talked about this, you know. He'll run interference for me. Up, 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 I'm coming to get you. You're not supposed to be doing that, right? That there's an accountability that helps us grow through the confession of sins. And in the early church, one of the disciplines and practices was confessing sin to one another, which, by the way, is how you get the confession of sins to the priests. There's an understanding that, that airing it publicly in a safe space helps me recover from it and repent from it. Worship, of course, is one of our corporate disciplines. The writer of Hebrews tells us, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, as some do. You ought to be in worship. It is a critical piece of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You cannot grow sitting at home every Sunday. Right? You've got to be in corporate worship. Things happen in church that you need to grow in your walk with the Lord. Things happen. Listen, I, don't, I know church can be a horrible experience in some places, and many of us have had a bad taste left in our mouth at some church at some point, but there's still something you need. Christ did not establish the church for you to think it was optional. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus builds the church. Matthew 16, he says, upon this rock I built my church. If Christ himself breathes the church into existence, it is not optional for the believer. Yeah. Got to be in worship. We're called to celebrate, called to praise the Lord, to thank God for the things God has done. That celebration is part of our discipline. And we're called to seek and give guidance to one another. That part of what helps us grow is not simply confessing, but giving each other wisdom. That the one place I ought to be able to find, find some good advice in is in the body of faith. Right? Now, many of us know what it's like to trust folk outside the church more than you do inside. But ultimately, one of our disciplines corporately is to give each other wise counsel. Um, he lists some outward disciplines that I found really challenging. The first one is that, that we ought to practice a simple life. If you think about it, we are good at complicating our lives. We're good at adding things to the calendar, of finding ourselves stressed out. A stressed out saint is not a good witness of Jesus. So, someone who's always on edge, blood pressure high, always tense, few short, that does not exemplify the grace and the mercy of God that's supposed to be operating in our lives. A stressed out saint is not a good witness. That the Bible literally calls us to live simple lives. And so if you look at it, if you look at the lifestyle of like monks and nuns, especially in the early stage of Christ, Christian history, you'll find that they were all about living a very austere and simple life, right? Not complicated by things, but living a daily life in peace. Okay? One of our outward distances is also solitude. When you read through scripture, look at how many times Jesus intentionally got away from the crowd. Intentionally said, I need to be alone with God. And I'm trying to reach a place in my own personal and pastoral life where once a year, I take time off to be in a spiritual solitude retreat with the Lord. No kids, no church, no school, just sitting away with God 
quiet and I finally found, it's amazing, the Catholics do this really well. So when I was looking for Christian retreat centers, the ones that really catered to me were the Catholic ones. Um, and so uh, this year when I take my sabbatical, I'm starting off with a week at a, <laughs> a Catholic, um, it's a Catholic retreat center that is far away, there's no television, uh, the, the diet is about as bland as it can be, and you don't talk to nobody all day long. You just sit outside and they give you a scripture and you read that one scripture all day long. I'm going to know at least four verses of the Bible when I get back real well. <laughs> um, so he names simplicity, solitude, and then you won't believe this. One of the disciplines that helps us draw closer to the Lord is submission to authority, especially in the body of Christ. Now, I'm not saying this to try to make docile members who just do whatever the pastor says. That's not it at all. But a disruptive Christian is not a good witness of Christ. A disruptive church member, someone who's always stirring up stuff, someone who's always engaged in argumentation, someone who's always conflictual, someone who's always controversial, that we learn to practice submission to authority so that we learn how to submit to Jesus Christ, right? Um, submission is part of that. I knew it was going to be quiet there, so I'll move to the next slide. Um, some of our inner disciplines, we've already talked about some of these. Uh, devotion and meditation on the Word. The exercise that we just went through that our staff ministers led us through, the Lecto Divina, is a way of meditating on the Word of God, uh, spending time in devotion um, with the Lord. Study of the Word of God is different than meditation. For those who've been in our Bible study long enough, you know the difference between studying and meditating is you're writing something down. You've got tools in front of you, pen, paper, concordance, uh, theological dictionaries. You're digging in the Word of God as opposed to just reading it. Um, you're following the trail of reference scriptures. You're doing a Bible study on walking by faith, and you're noting all the places in the Bible where it mentions walking by faith. It's a study of the Word of God, not just to read. And then, of course, you spoke about prayer and now fasting. Of all the disciplines that we practice in our inner life, I'll suggest to you that fasting is probably the most neglected that many people who fast tend to fast incorrectly. And it's not to say that, that there's no power there, but it doesn't achieve what it could. When's the most popular season for fasting? Lent, Lent right? Which begins how many days before Easter? 46. No, 46. Thank you, Deacon Bender, you're paying attention. It's not 40 days before, <laughs> it's 46 days before because the Sundays don't count. There we go, all right. Uh, begins on Ash Wednesday. And have you ever, like, heard people say they're fasting and it's almost ridiculous what they've given up? So how does giving up chocolate make you a better Christian? Right? And, but you know, you know, a ton of people give up sweets over Lent and they feel that, that, that they're, what do we gain from that? How, how is that making me stronger? Right? Lent one of the reasons I avoid a corporate fast during Lent is because Lent has gotten so commercialized, almost like Christmas to a certain degree, right? That we've lost the sense of what it's all about. Um, let me read you a quote from John Edwards, um, one of the famous preachers of the Great Awakening. He said, so little is said about fasting, yet it seems to me it is a duty that all professing Christians should practice and frequently practice. There are so many occasions of both the spiritual and temporal nature that do properly require it. One of my favorite quotes. Another is by John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. John Wesley says, the man, and forgive the um, masculine language, um, the person who never fasts is no more in the way to heaven than the person who never prays. But John Wesley believed Fasting was as necessary as prayer, and Jesus put it up there with us. Fasting is one of the most, the least understood and therefore the least or most incorrectly practiced disciplines in Christianity. So before we seek off to go into a fast in January, I want to spend tonight talking to you about what fasting is, where it comes from, some biblical examples, and then talk specifically about what Seek 2019 is so you can know where your prayerful about committing yourself uh, for January 6th through January 26th.
Let's start at the beginning. Some of you already know, uh, to fast really means to abstain from food. Okay? And therefore, the term breakfast or break fast is to break the abstaining from food that you had during the night. Right? That's where the term breakfast comes from. You are breaking your fast, that you fasted from dinner until you wake up in the morning. Um, you abstain from food. Um, you didn't eat in the middle of the night in your sleep. And so you break the fast. Fasting is critical in just about every other world religion. Um, in Hinduism, it is a critical component of their discipline. Um, in Baha'i, they fast for a month, once a year. Um, Buddhism, they practice fasting during the extreme times of meditation. Um, those who are familiar with anything of Islam know that Ramadan, in the beginning of the year, is a devoted month of fasting uh, for devout Muslims. And in the Jewish faith, there are at least three seasons when they are called to fast. Uh, typically, all of these are dietary, that it has something to do with restriction on food. Uh, for some in Buddhism during their extreme meditations, it's no food at all for an extended period. Uh, for Ramadan, it's from sunup to sundown that you do not eat. Um, so most of these fasts are limited to food. And I'm going to argue with you tonight, suggest, teach, uh, that that's just but one way that you can withdraw from the world and draw closer to the Lord. There are some other ways as well. Um, in the Bible, you're going to find some specific times and references and seasons of fasting. When Jonah finally goes back to Nineveh, well, goes to Nineveh and preaches in preparation for repentance, the Ninevites go into a call of fasting for the entire land. Um, you'll find that Darius fasts uh, when Daniel's brought out of the lion's den and um, the entire nation is called to follow God. Acts chapter 10 is important when Peter acknowledges that uh, God's Good news of Jesus Christ is available to Gentile as well as Jews. We find that Cornelius, who is a Gentile, has been fasting um, prior to receiving that word. Um, the Benjamites, you see them fasting in Judges, Ezra fast, Ezra 8. You get those in Daniel. Um, you'll find Israel being called to a place of fasting in 1 Samuel 31, 1 Samuel 7, Isaiah 58. Um, in Esther, there's a reference to fasting in Exodus. So all those listed. What is most important, of course, you know, is that we know Jesus fasts um, in Matthew 4 in preparation uh, for his confrontation with the devil in the wilderness and for his ministry. And then in Mark 9, it's a parallel to what we read in Matthew 17, where Jesus says some things only come to us through prayer and fasting. Um, so it should not surprise you uh, that there are multiple references to fasting in scripture so we know that it was a practice not only of the Jews but even of the early Christians uh, that they carried that over into their walk with the Lord and therefore it is still part of our discipline today to fast. So what are the biblical purposes of fasting? Why, why do we fast? When do we fast? How do we fast? Let's start with the purposes. One of the very first purposes is it gives us the power to learn to subdue our flesh. Turn with me to the book of Romans. Let's go to Romans 7. Read a passage of scripture that you've probably heard before. Romans 7. I'm going to begin in verse number 15. Romans 7, verse 15. You got me? All right. This is what Paul writes. For what I am doing, I do not understand. And what I will to do or what I want to do, that I don't practice. But what I hate, that's what I do. If then I do what I don't want to do, I agree with the law, that the law is good. But it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Verse 18, watch this. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Somebody say amen. amen. <clears throat> For I've got the will to do 
But how to do what is good, I don't know. The good that I will do, I do not do, but the evil that I don't want to do, that's what I practice. How many people have ever been there? How, how many of you put your initial right next to verse 19, right? Okay, okay. Go, if that's your Bible, go on and put your signature right there. Um, all of us have had that moment of, here it is, here it is. Lord, if you get me out of this, Lord, if, if you just look beyond my fault and see my need, Lord, if you can find it to be merciful to me on this, I promise I will never, ever, ever, ever do this again. A few months later, now, Lord, I know I said <laughs> I would never do this again. And what happens, let me tell you how frustrating this becomes, eventually you reach the point where you're not seeking God's forgiveness any longer because what the devil tells you is you know and God knows you ain't quitting. So there's no point in praying about it anymore. And then rather than trying to change, you learn to start to cope with something. He says, I know what that's like. Verse 20, now if I do what I will to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. I find in the law that evil is present with me, the one who wants to do good. Why is evil always present with us? The flesh. Because in my flesh, no good thing dwells. Paul acknowledges that the reason I always do what I don't want to do is because wherever I go, there I am. Right? And wherever I am, my flesh is there. And in my flesh, there's no good thing. Your flesh loves sin. And what Paul recognizes within every believer is that there's a battle going on between your flesh and the spirit of God that dwells in you. They battle every single day. There's not one of us living who every day doesn't have a fleshly urge to do something that's contrary to what the Spirit is trying to get you to do. And the Holy Spirit fights with your flesh every day. Now, there may have been some battles you've won, some things you've walked away from, some things you've been delivered from, and if I know human the way I know human, and there are going to be some things you wrestle with every day. Right? And just because you wrestle with something every day, a temptation, a desire, does not mean that you're not saved, does not mean that God doesn't want you to have victory. It means you're human. And every day, your flesh wants to do something that's different than your spirit. These two are always fighting with each other. You know what the best example is? Have you ever seen the cartoon with a, a devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other? Right? That, that's exactly what our lives are. Right? Temptation and spirit. And what Paul argues is that this battle happens in your mind. And your mind has to make a decision of which one you're going to follow. You never just fall into sin. Right? That's why the danger, so here's the danger of some sin. Have you, have you ever seen in your own life, the more you think about it, the more you find a way to make it happen? Yeah. There's some things I just don't need to think on too long, right? Because the more I think about it, the more I'm going to want it. And the more I'm going to want it, the more I'm going to go after it, because now the flesh is winning. The battlefield is the mind between the flesh and the spirit. Who wins? Which one wins? Did, did you just say depends on the day, Deacon Bennett? <laughs> You know which one wins? Which one is stronger? In any given moment, right? So you're right, you better on some days, my flesh is weak and my spirit is strong. And then there's some moments when the flesh is weak and so is the spirit. And I yield. If you look at any pattern of sin in your life, anything you've really struggled with in life, you should be able to identify what triggers your flesh. If, if you really thought about it, 
you should know the road that leads to it. So I know what leads to me drinking too much. I know what leads to me doing what I shouldn't be doing. I know what leads to me cussing somebody out. I know my triggers. And the question is, am I strong enough to stop along the way because the spirit doesn't want us to sin? Someone said it right, whichever one you feed the most. So here's why, flesh, why fasting is gonna be powerful. If I learn not to feed my flesh, I can weaken it. If, if I learn not to yield to every desire, I can win this battle. That the power of fasting is this, that I'm literally saying no to my flesh. Now let me tell you why it's important as a discipline. My dad once told me discipline simply means this, being able to tell yourself no. Now we're good at telling other people no. But we're not always strong in telling ourselves, Howard, you don't need that. Howard, that's not good for you. And because we never practice telling ourselves no in moments of temptation, we don't know how. All we know how to do is go after what we want. Whereas the true discipline, life, the one that we see in Jesus Christ, is one who's able to tell himself no. So part of the reason we fast is I've got to learn to tell myself there's some things you can't have, yeah. Yeah. Right? including food, which is one of our strongest fleshly desires. Yeah. Right? It, it has been proven. So I'm, I'm going to give you a, 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 an intimate story. My dad was diagnosed with prostate cancer at 50. Um, and he didn't die until he was 80. It, it came and went, came and went. And when he passed, um, the doctor said, you need, you need to go get checked because there's a strong history of prostate cancer in your family. Right? So it was very difficult for me at 30 to hear a doctor tell me, you're going to have prostate cancer. Right? It, you, all your uncles, all your grandfathers, your father, your black man, it's almost inevitable. And then she said something I will never forget. She said, but most men can fight it if they would learn to change their diet. And, she, and I said, really? She said, and that's the thing that takes most black men out. They can't change their diet. Think about it. Changing your diet is one of the most difficult things in the world to do. Because we get in patterns. I know what I like. So I used to have a really, really, really bad habit. I'm a salty snacker. Right? I'm a, I'm a salty snacker. What's, what, you too? Oh, I thought you was judging me. I was about to... <laughs> She's talking about some yes, Lord. I'm about to go, oh, okay. I'm going to stay here and call yours out, huh? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I was real bad, real bad habit of salty snacking at night, right? And you know, the doctor's like, you got to stop all the salty snacking. You got to decrease your sodium. And let me tell you, the hardest thing in the world to do was to lay in bed and not eat chips. It was hard. I've been doing it all my life. I, I, I ain't totally there, Lorraine. I'm... I'm you, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. Y'all pray for me. Uh, changing diet. Now, imagine what happens if I learn to crave those fleshly desires of what I want to eat. How strong I've become. How I've weakened the flesh. So the very first reason we fast is to learn to subdue the flesh. But where most people make a mistake is that it's not simply subduing the flesh. It's also learning at the same time to strengthen the spirit. Right? Because simply weakening this doesn't make this stronger. So I'm trying to weaken this, so I'm trying to take this down so I can take this up. So let me tell you why fasting during Lent sometimes just doesn't work. Because all you're doing is giving something up, but you're not replacing it with something that makes your spirit stronger. So the whole purpose of fasting is that when, when I've identified what I'm giving up, whenever I have that urge for that or I would be doing that, Rather than doing what I've given up or yielding to the urge, I'm trying to find a way to strengthen my spirit to give me the strength to continue to say no. So if, if chocolate is your thing and you give up chocolate for Lent, that's only half of fasting. 
The second half means now whenever I see chocolate, want chocolate, or would buy chocolate, I'm replacing that with feeding myself with the word of God, with meditating, with going down in prayer, because that's what's strengthening my spirit through the other disciplines. So it's not just about giving up something in the flesh. It's also about doing the things in lieu of that that help my spirit get stronger, that draw me closer to the Lord, that put me on my knees, that throw me in my Bible, that make me practice what allows me to grow stronger in my walk. And most folk don't supplement it. They just cut this out. And what they choose to cut out is not even a real sacrifice. That's why most fasting begins with food, because food is the biggest sacrifice you can make and one of the hardest to control. Give you a quote from A.W. Tozer. If religion requires us sometimes to fast and deny our natural appetites, it is to lessen that struggle and war that is in our nature. It is to render our bodies fitter instruments of purity and more obedient to the good motions of divine grace. It is to dry up the springs of our passions that war against the soul, to cool the flame of our blood and render the mind more capable of divine meditations so that although these abstinences give some pain to the body, yet they so lessen the power of bodily appetites and passions and so increase our taste of spiritual joys. Amen. That I can only enjoy the spiritual things when I've stopped feasting on the fleshly things. Have you ever been really, really hungry? And (laughs) did your daughter just raise her hand? (laughs) Yes, Joy. Have you ever been really, really hungry, but couldn't, you didn't have access to a good meal, so you grabbed a snack? You grabbed like a candy bar? And two things happened. One, it momentarily killed your hunger so that when you get to real food, you don't want it. But secondly, especially if it's a high carb, it gives you that real sugar rush real quick. You know that feeling? When you're really hungry and you grab like a bag of chips and then 10 minutes later, you're like, man, I shouldn't eat those, right? This is exactly what Tozer is saying, that there's something better for you, a spiritual meal, but we're so conditioned to having quick snacks that feed the flesh. As opposed to learning to wait and deal with the hunger until I can get what truly makes me stronger. So we're going to fast to subdue the flesh, to strengthen the spirit. One of the very third reasons biblically that people fast is to discern the will of God. Can I tell you one of the most difficult things in the world to do is, and you already know this, and I'm suspect of people who don't struggle with this, one of the hardest things in the world is to know what God's saying to you. I mean, think about it. We long for, we long for affirmation of God's will, so much so I would just wish, wouldn't it be nice if you just woke up and every day there was a letter that God put on the foot of your bed, this is what I want you to do today. Ah, God, Charlotte or Atlanta, neither one, New York. Thank you, Jesus. That's all I needed to know. Right? We struggle to know the will of God. It's not that simple. Um, and we become dependent upon external sources. Have, have you ever really, really, are, do you all remember the story of Gideon? Anybody remember Gideon, the, the, the soldiers, the battle? G- yeah, the fleece, right? Gideon is so desperate to know God's will. He says, all right, Lord, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a fleece outside. I'm going to put a rug out, right? And what I want you to do, this is the sign I want. Uh, let, let everything around the rug be wet and the rug not be wet, and then I'm going to know what you're calling me to do, right? God does that. And then Gideon says, all right, all right, let's flip it around. Let's do this, Lord. Uh, let the rug be wet and everything else around it be dry. Have you ever had a Gideon moment where you used to tell, all right, Lord, this is what I need. This is what I need you to do. I need you uh, to let him be wearing a blue suit today and... You know, let her, you know, and, and, or you become desperate looking for signs. I, w- I almost died laughing listening to Marcia this weekend talking about a car getting in front of you with Georgia license plate and you missed the sign. You ever just so desperate that anything was a sign, right? right? Oh, it's cold outside. The Lord's telling me I need to move down south. You know, just anything at all. Because um, knowing the will of God is difficult, right? How, is, is this what I want or is this what God wants for me? What's the biggest obstacle to discernment? Desire. Because you can want something so badly, you convince yourself it's God's will. 
Ooh, you bet that that's a, that's a grown up, amen. There's some. Yeah, I've won, I wanted it, went after it, and then then prayed about it. <laughs> um, fasting. Here, here's I want you to write this down. If prayer is talking to God, fasting is listening for the answer. If prayer is talking to God, fasting is listening for the answer. John 10 says this repeatedly, my sheep know my voice. And sometimes I've read that and felt out of sync, like, Lord, I don't know your voice. I mean, there's some moments when I'm sure I know what God's saying, and in others where I just don't know. And what makes it difficult, if you remember 1 Kings 19, which you read when you get home, Elijah's listening for the Lord. He goes outside, the earth shakes. And the Bible says, but God wasn't in the earthquake. There's a fire, but God wasn't in the fire. A whirlwind, God wasn't in the whirlwind. And then the Bible says, and God spoke through a still, small voice. How many of you all were raised old school? You think you're old school. Old school parents, old school teachers. Let me tell you something about old school teachers that I distinctly remember. They're not going to yell over you. They're going to yell over the class. Give you that look, and I'm going to wait until you all calm down and listen. Right? Room could be rambunctious. I'm not going to yell. You all going to quiet down and listen. God does not yell over the other voices in your life. We are bombarded with noise, and God talks like this. Now, what do you have to do to hear God talk? Turn the volume down on other things, right? Cooper, you can't hear. Cooper, take your head. For, I, I hate it when the boys have them beats on, and I'm talking to him, and he's not listening, and then he looks up. What'd you say? What'd you say? Take your headphones off and listen to me. When we fast, we're taking off the noise of other things so we can hear the still small voice of God. Hear me, brother, hear me, sister. God never wants his mystery to be a wi uh, his will to be a mystery. God's not playing some game with you. See if you can figure me out. No, I'm just not gonna yell. I'm gonna make you shut off other things so you can hear me. I want you to know whether he's the one for you. I want you to know whether you're supposed to stay on that job. I want you to know what city you're supposed to move to. I want you to know when to go back to school. But I'm not going to yell. I'm not going to raise my voice. You're going to have to turn other stuff down. And that's what we do in fasting, so we can discern the will of God. And real quick, the fourth reason you see in the Bible is a call to corporate fasting so we can be in unity, have solidarity with one another. There's something about going through a fast together that binds us and strengthens us. Anybody that's ever worked out knows there's nothing wrong with working out by yourself, but sure is a whole lot easier when we got other folk with you. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Somebody motivates you, push you. Um, let me tell you what fasting is not. I want to make sure I get our time right. Fasting, one, is not necessary for salvation. Fasting is not going to make you saved. Right? It will help you grow in your salvation, but it's not going to make you saved. Fasting is not a way of manipulating the will of God um, so that God does what you want to have done. If he ain't the one for you, fasting ain't going to make him the one for you. <laughs> Amen. You can fast all year long. If that's not God's will, that's not God's will. And fasting is not a spiritual badge of honor. Do you know people who wear spirituality like almost like a medal so you know what d degree or what rank they have in the kingdom? They can talk in tongues. They can pray for five hours. They quote every scripture. Jesus is clear when he gives instructions on fasting in Matthew 6. When you fast, people shouldn't even really know it. Right? This is not something we brag and boast about. This is about an inward journey to the Lord, not about, you know, you bragging and boasting about it. So one of the things I'm going to share with you in the fast is that you're trying to appear and act as normal as possible. You don't fast and get all spiritually weird. <laughs> mm. Mm. 
So how do you get to a fast that's pleasing to the Lord? Let's move into it. One, you have to sense a call or need to fast, either personally or corporately. So many of you raised your hands. How many of you who raised your hands have been on a fast, went on it simply because you felt you needed to? If you ever did it simply because you did What we've not done in the 10 years I've been here is a corporate fast, where you're fasting because you believe your spiritual leaders have called you to it. And therefore, trusting in that, you're going to go in this fast. Um, And it's my prayer that as I share with you the corporate call, you will also sense a personal one. Uh, That you'll say, I'm not simply doing this because pastor asked. I'm doing this because the Holy Spirit has placed it on my heart. Um, And hopefully you're here tonight um, as part of that desire to know personally whether this is what God has called you to do. Uh, We want to determine the specific goal and desired outcome of the fast. Um, You don't simply fast to say you did it. There's some goal. I want to to discern God's will about whether I uh, should accept the call to be pastor of Alpha Street back in 2007 when it came and I didn't fast. I just followed my flesh and said no. But what, if, what would have happened if Dean Garrett called and said, you know, you're the one. And I said, well, you know what? Uh, give me 30 days to fast and discern whether this is God's will. Right? That, that's, that's the kind of answer you want. Right? That's what you want from your spiritual leader. I need to go along with God for 30 days. Not just, well, what, what's the salary? <laughs> How much y'all paying? <laughs> um, 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 um. You do want to choose the type of fast and duration. We're going to talk about those in just a moment. What types of fast and how long? Just so you know, there's no biblical commandment for how long or short. You can fast for one day and it'd be powerful. You pass for three days. Seven, the most common number, of course, is 40. Uh, but there's no designation. So the fact that we're going from 6 to 26, there's, new, there's no numerical significance. Okay? It's, it fits in our calendar. It's what we sense is the right season to do. Um, we're starting right after the first of the year, so we could start on the sun, uh, start that Sunday, and then we want to end in time for the Kaya 10-year anniversary celebration. Praise the Lord. Uh, you know, uh, that's, that's, that's not a good way to break the end of fast. Amen. Uh, to be at the Smithsonian with, with Tamiya and some good food. Eh? So, so that's why we chose 6 to 26. Don't make it deep. Don't search for no biblical number, right? <laughs> and, and it was convenient and expedient. So that's why we put it in there. So the duration and the type. Let's talk about the types of fast real quick. Um, how many of you ever heard the Daniel fast? Okay. How many of you ever tried the Daniel fast? Okay. You need to read the book of Daniel when you get home, first couple chapters. Remember when Daniel and the three Hebrew boys... Um, are sent into exile um, in order to fatten them up and prepare them. Nebuchadnezzar wanted them to eat the Babylonian foods. And Daniel decided that that was sacrilegious to his walk with the Lord. And he goes on a fast. He says, let me eat, my, let me eat mine. And at the end of the training period, see if I'm as strong as those who ate the meat diet. Daniel fast is, for all practical purposes, there, there, are many different ways, there are many ways to look at it. For some, they think that it's just a vegetarian one. Right, that there are no meats involved. Some would push it and say the Daniel fast is a vegan fast. And if you know the difference between vegetarianism and veganism, uh, you know that has to do with poultry. Uh, you don't eat anything that has a parent, L- long story. So not even eggs, no dairy. And then there's, then there's some who push the Daniel fast and say that it is a raw food diet, right? That even the vegetables you eat are all raw. Um, Amazing, when, when my oldest son started training with this trainer, he put him on a raw food diet for six weeks. Um, he said, you know, you're, the reason you're not jumping high and strong enough because you're, you're eating the wrong stuff. We gotta get you out of five guys and get you on to, yeah, and literally. And it worked, like it, like it worked, worked. Um, Deuce is dunking now with no problem because his legs are stronger because he's not putting the wrong stuff in his body. I mean, if you all have ever been around athletes, you know they're very strict about their diets. The one thing about Tom Brady, right? He's very, very strict in his diets. Um, So we're going to talk about the possibility of a Daniel fast uh, for some of us. Um, This is the the option I'm taking um, in trying to do the vegan and no processed and no white, no white stuff. So no flours, no sugars, um, no rice, um, anything uh, that's white that there's nothing racial about that I'm just, just... 
you know. Um, it's funny because my, <laughs> my doctor actually said that to me when I went vegan about a year ago. She said, you, you just got to give up white. I said, well, what do you mean give up white? She said, food, give up white. I said, okay, thank you. I'm sure, you know, you know, I got some members I really love. Uh, um, in Christianity, there's something, and I don't really like this term, but since we're making racial jokes, uh, there's something in Christianity called the black fast. And it was the most rigorous, and it was a fast where uh, you could only eat one meal a day, and you could only eat it when the sun went down, and that meal could have no, no meat involved. Um, so no meats. And that was called a black fast. Interesting, when you get to home, I want you to take a look at Isaiah 58, where God expresses extreme displeasure with Israel for fasting from food, but still not acting for justice for the poor. And the Lord says, what kind of fast do you think that? Do you think I'm pleased with the fact that you're not eating chicken, but you're not doing anything to change the lives of the poor? that some component of the fasting has to be oriented towards the care of those in our world. And I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute. And then, of course, you know that there are other types of fasts. Um, fasting from television, that's one of the ways of turning that volume down. Right? If you're like me, sometimes I come in the house, I just put the TV on for background noise. Right? Oh, you know what I've gotten into is a bad habit. Um, the Lord has a way of waking me up consistently at 4.30 every morning. And I know it's to pray. And the only way I can sometimes go back to sleep is put the TV on in the background. And putting the TV on keeps me from praying and wrestling in my spirit so I can go back to sleep. And I realize that's not what God wants. I'm supposed to be wrestling with something. So to be praying over something, but I put it on Sports Center so I can go back to sleep. Okay. Um, the very first time I called a corporate fast at my first church, uh, we were going to fast during Lent. And we we going hardcore in the paint. You know, I was 27, so I'm, I'm going hardcore. Um, and I said, we're giving up TV. We're giving up TV for all of Lent. Nobody's going to watch TV. And uh, then, then I realized it, um, March came. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was, that was a hard one. That was March Madness was happening, and Duke was playing. And I'm like, oh, God, I can't. So, yeah, I broke my fast. Um, so, but don't tell the saints that. They don't know. Uh, one, definitely is social media. In our world, think of how much of a priority we put on social media. Some of us get up and we check our phones immediately in the morning. Um, computer, email, social media again, something you can give up. Well, work will be an exception, and we'll talk about that. There are some things that are not expedient during a fast. So medicinally, some people can't fast from eating because you have to take medicine that requires food on your stomach. So we're not, we're not asking you to do what's not expedient. You should not fast and lose your job because you're not replying to emails. <laughs> there will be no poor saint's request for you losing your job for not reading your emails and replying to your boss. And, uh, those are different. But personal emails, you can decide, you know what, I'm going to get off personal email for a moment. And what you do is you notify people in advance. Um, telephone, unnecessary talk. You're going to see that we have a challenge in our fast for um, a three-day period of silence as much as, as much as possible, of no talking. Um, but whatever you give up, there should be a sacrifice attached to it. It should be something you like or are used to that you engage in. Um, so for me, over Lent, giving up chocolate doesn't mean anything because I, I don't like chocolate. Now, giving up television, that's hard. Some of our goals, the reason we're doing this, one, I want to introduce the practice of an annual corporate fast. I don't want us to always fill out our calendar and not put on our calendar what we need to do corporately as a church to grow in our walk with the Lord every year. Um, so what we're starting this year will happen every year at Alfred Street. A time, and it'll move throughout the year, when I'm asking you to join us in a corporate fast okay? so that we know the discipline of it, right? Number two, so we can have unity um, within our church family. Three is preparation for what I believe are some amazing things we've got to do in 2019. Um, sitting on church council and in leadership, I will tell you that there are some major things coming up in this new year 
that I believe our church needs to be prepared for. We're getting ready to sit before city council. We're contemplating a secondary site. We're looking at expanding our affordable housing footprint in the city. We're looking at doing another trip overseas. We're looking at doing some more mission work. So with all that, I just think it's important that we prepare our minds and bodies to be used of the Lord. And that's what this fast is about. And then also for your own personal spiritual discipline. So let me share with you the options for SEEK 2019. There are three areas we're targeting. Our physical, our social, and our financial. And you're going to find there are different ways for you to connect in each of the three areas, even if you only choose one. Right? One is our diet. There are a few options out here. One, some people can choose to go on the Daniel Fast. And we'll put a little bit up, Mark. We want to write a little bit about the Daniel Fast, what the restrictions are, just in case you're not able to translate that uh, by what you see in the Bible. But we share with you what that is about no frieds, no dairy, um, you know, no meats, um, and what that looks like for the Daniel Fast. This is one I've chosen, the Daniel Fast. Others may choose simply, you know what, I'm just not going to eat between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., that I'll fast 12 hours every day and discipline my flesh. Now, clearly, water is allowed during this time. Water with lemon is allowed. Seltzer water, but not sodas, anything like that. But you can drink water because it's, it's essential to the body. We're not asking you to go with no water. And we'll put all this online. You'll hear the uh, specifics about it. And then for some, maybe you can't do any of those. So you're just going to eliminate sweets, caffeine, and it shouldn't be and or, it should be and alcoholic beverages. I don't think it's too much to ask you not to drink alcohol for 20 days, right? Um, if, you, if you can't go 20 days without alcohol, I need you to see me um, after church. We've got a ministry that we need to put you in. Uh, <laughs> um, um, that, that's, that's not meant to be funny because for some people, alcohol is a struggle, right? I know that caffeine one is going to get me. I've done it before. I'm a coffee holic in the morning, and I know it's about to come, caffeine headaches, right? Um, which shows that I'm addicted to caffeine, right? And one of the reasons I enjoy this type of fast is to prove to myself nothing has that much control over me. Caffeine doesn't, alcohol doesn't, sugar doesn't. So I'm asking you to think about which one of these you're going to join if you are. For some, maybe this is something you can't do, so we're asking you to do more physical, to join us with 30 minutes a day of physical exercise. Um, and for some, that may be the best way to start. You know, I know, again, this is one I'll be engaged in and hopefully do some of it with the staff that we'll be able to work out together uh, for 30 minutes a day and spend some time in, in prayer. During the final three days of the fast, January 24th to 26th, there's a physical challenge for those who want that we're only going to partake in a water fast. And so this isn't for everyone, but you can prayerfully discern whether you want to do this. And even if you don't know right now, maybe you'll make your decision as you get towards the 24th because you're going to feel so strong physically after going through the Daniel fast that you're going to challenge yourself and say, you know what, I'm only going to drink water for the next three days. We are asking you to consult your physician uh, before you uh, embrace this challenge or any dietary changes to make certain it's safe for you to do so physically. Uh, but there'll be some of us who check, even if you don't check it till again, December 23rd, you go online and say, you know what, I am going to do it. I didn't think I could, but I'm feeling good. I feel strong in the spirit. I'm not going to eat. I'm just going to have water for the last three days. Okay. That's the physical challenge. Social. We're asking you uh, to eliminate social media. I'm staying off Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to share with you very quickly in the end, if you give me about five more minutes, there is a, um, I don't want to say it's a meme. What is it? It's a flyer almost. It's a, that we're going to, you can download when you sign up for the fast that you can then post on your social media pages that allow people to know you're fasting and encourage them to join in with you. So it'll go out. All of Alpha Tree Baptist Church social media is going black for the fast. Uh, so to go out once before the fast begins, and then there'll be no social media posts for the entire duration of the fast from anything Alpha Street related. And I'm asking you to do the same. Let's, let's get off uh, because those things occupy so much of our time. Uh, eliminating television and movies, uh, whether that be cable, satellite, TV, Netflix, whatever, you may decide you're going to stay off of television. Now, clearly, real quick, let me go back. For the dietary one, you can choose all three. 
right? So for me, the Daniel fast, although I am going to eat from six to six to six, I'm going to Daniel fast and I'm going to eliminate sweets, caffeine, etc. But some of you may choose all three. You say, you know what? I'm going to Daniel fast. And I'm only going to eat after 6 p.m. and it's going to be only the vegan food, right? Um, I think the big challenge is I want to make certain that the culinary knows we're on the Daniel fast, so they've got to participate as well. Don't be cooking bacon on Sunday. <laughs> so I'm up here preaching, smelling bacon, like. <laughs> no, no, no Sunday breakfast. You, we're, we're all in this together, right? We're either doing this or we're not. Okay. Um, um, or you can choose both. You can get off TV and social media. But I'm asking you to consider at least one. Right? And maybe finding a prayer partner to pray with every day, if you don't have one already. It's part of that social challenge. During the final three days, the challenge for the social is no talking. Um, unnecessary conversation ended. So the 24th to 26th, not only am I only doing water uh, with lemon for me, but I'm also choosing not to speak. Um, safe having to preach, of course, on the 24th, 25th and 26th. No, 26, excuse me. So if you're joining with us, that last three-day challenge for the social challenge is no talking. Now realize, if you're going to do these, you've got to prepare people around you, right? You've got to let them know. Um, and it's a good tool to witness. You know, just let you know I'm in a spiritual journey with the Lord for the next three days. I'm cutting back from extraneous conversation. Um, and I ask you to respect that. Okay? If you can do that on your job, great. If you just can do it with family and friends, that's fine. But there are different levels for you to join in. We're asking you to, um, the financial one is to change frivolous spending. Literally, for this fast, we're asking you not to purchase anything other than food and essentials like gas, but we're not buying what our regular routine is. So I'm giving up my coffee. And I know that every morning I spend a dollar fifteen cent on a 16 ounce coffee. So I'm putting away that dollar fifteen as an offering I'm gonna give back to the Lord because what we're asking you to do is to hold back financially from what you would spend. And as you make that offering, we're going to use that offering to sow into the lives of the poor in our community so that Lord is not displeased with us simply because we didn't eat such and such, but we also sowed into. So every dollar you give, there's going to be a special offering at the end of the fast. Every dime that's raised in that offering, we're going to identify a cause that we're giving it to. That we're asking the Lord to give us discernment over during the fast, and we're going to make a difference in the lives of those who are poor among us. All right? So if you're used to Starbucks, you're giving up that $5 a day that you spend on Starbucks, right? And at the end of the fast, you should have 20 days of $5 offerings that you're going to be giving to the Lord, right? Everybody with me? So that's going to be a $100 offering. You, we're asking you to eliminate spending um, and not buying non-essentials. So this is not the time to go get the dress you've been waiting on. So I'm telling you now, if you're going to the Kaya event, get your outfit before January 6th, right? Because January 6th to 26th, and make sure you size down a little bit because you're going to lose weight on the Daniel fast, right? This, this has a dual victory, dual victory in Jesus' name. I'm going to be spiritually strong, and I'm going to be snatched up for that. For that. Uh, did I use that term correctly? I'm going to be snatched. All right, all right. Uh, so we're asking you not, not to go on spending sprees like this. We're staying out the mall. We're staying out of Target. You know, only essentials. Um, and the money that we're saving uh, we're giving back. So the financial cha challenge on this one is the end of three days. So the first one is no food. We're doing water only. The second one is no talking. The third one for the financial is we're praying and asking God to put on our heart what our sacrificial offering should be. There's no amount. No one's going to tell you, God, do I have the ability to give? Knowing that every dime that's raised is not going in anyone's pocket. It's going in someone's stomach who's hungry. It's going over someone's roof who's homeless, right? That we're going to give all we can to be a blessing to others. And we'll publicize. We'll let you know how much that was and where that went. Um, we're still discerning what we're going to do about it, what we're going to do with it. So those are the three options. Um, you'll find a lot more information online. Registration, um, not really registration, but covenant partnership begins this Saturday. We ask you to go online and click. You'll fill in some information. Then you'll click which options you're partnering with us in. We just want to track so we can tell you, hey, you know, 1,300 people are on the Daniel fast with you. You're not alone with this. 
you know, someone else has decided to only drink water over the next three days so that we can have our numbers and track how that grows every year. But I am asking you to be prayerful um, and to join in with us in our time of prayer and fasting. Now, did they have the, uh, the flyer up for me to show? It is? There it is. So when you, um, when you covenant in partnership with us, you'll be able to download this that you can then post on your social media. Um, we're asking you to post it on January 5th at noon. We want it to flood out all together, so not you know, randomly here and there, but if everyone posts it at the same time, it's gonna get a lot more attention and the world will know we're going black off of social media and we're asking you to join in with us. Okay? It's not simply limited to the members of Alpha Street, our online community, our online family, your family and friends in Texas are free and welcome to join in with us. Just direct them to the uh, website, all the information's there. They can register as a covenant partner um, and we believe that God's gonna do some amazing things in this church um, as we learn the discipline of prayer and fasting. Amen? Real quick, show of hands, and then I'm praying. How many people right now, just in prayer for discernment, think you're probably going to join us in one way or another? Going to join us one way or another. It's going to be great. Let me pray. I know we're about 10 minutes over. Thank you for being patient. I'm going to pray. Um, then if you would, I've got to run out two. One prayer request, one prayer support. Prayer request, I want to pray for the family, Brother Bill Emery, um, who went home to be with the Lord today. So if you would... Uh, just remember him. Bill was yeah, one of our most dedicated volunteers. He used to sit right back there every Sunday. Uh, praise support, and thank you all for your prayers. My mom's home, um, so I'm grateful for that. Yep. And she's ringing the bell again. <laughs> so I need to fast. <laughs> Come on, let's stand and close in prayer, and then we leave. Um, in the grace of God. Lord, as I move into this new year, my desire is to be a stronger Christian. To not stumble over the same things I did last year to not find myself failing in the same predicaments and issues, but being stronger. And I know that that requires fasting. I've got to weaken this flesh and strengthen my spirit. God, I'm asking you to speak to every sister, every brother whose heart is open to your call to grow. And share with them where and how you're leading them to fast. We ask your blessings upon Seek 2019 for what we believe will be the more than 1,000 people who connect with us to grow in their walk with you. That at the end of it, we would be stronger in our witness, more compassionate in our love, sound in our doctrine, and fit and prepared for the awesome things that are coming our way individually and as a church. Thank you, Lord, that I don't have to do it alone. There's a hand that I hold and I squeeze and let you know I'm glad we do this thing together. Yes. You matter to me. Yes. And I'm glad we're a family of faith. Yes. Now, God, keep us as we make our way safely home. We remember the legacy and the love of Bill Emery. Thank you for blessing us with him and now blessing him with you. Comfort his family. And let us never forget his model of sacrifice. Thank you, God. Give us rest tonight. Don't want to wake up tired tomorrow. May the joy of the Lord be our strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.